This is uh, Nelly Deutsch. The session is going to start. This is the third day of Connecting Online. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Nelly Deutsch. And I see Karen's with us. Okay, great. All right. So uh, this is the third day of Connecting Online, the fifth annual. It started in 2009, and we're going strong. And it seems that uh, we're getting very, very popular. That's with IQ, I see um getting ready there to help out because uh, a few universities have made this a requirement in other words they're asking their students to come to the uh sessions and to reflect so uh that's great news for the participants and the presenters because we all have something to say i guess and that's that's wonderful all right so the presenters are from around the globe We've gone through different countries. We're going to Australia today, so stay tuned for Australia. We're also going to have um, the next speaker. That's Crystal Brody. Dr. Brody is going to present next from the United States. We've gone through India, South Africa. We're also going to Italy uh, with Jana today. The last session is going to end in Italy. We've been to Brazil. We've been to uh, Abu Dhabi. We've been to... Uh, uh, Belgium here, Canada, uh, the United States, of course, India, Mexico, uh, the United Emirates, Israel, Cyprus. Have I missed a country? Probably not. So it's really uh, wonderful to be able to connect like this for learning. And that's what it's all about. I want to remind everybody that we're here to connect for learning. So have fun. No exams at the end. But there is a book chapter. All right, so I'm going to pass on the mic to Karen. There, it's echoing, so I guess you don't have your headset yet. Sorry for um, getting you before you were ready. <laughs> That's perfect. It's not echoing, so it's per. Oh, was that a cat? Oh, let's see the cat. You don't want the cat? Okay. Stephen likes his cats walking. I don't know if you were here yesterday. Stephen likes his cats walking all over his uh, desk as he speaks. It's still echoing for some reason. I don't know. Yes, we are. And good to see you, Karen. I hope you're feeling well. You look great. All right. So I'll mute my mic and let you go on. And introduce yourself, of course. You could say a lot more about yourself than I can, I'm sure. Okay, can I ask one tiny question? So everyone sees video and everyone sees the slides simultaneously, right? Yes, that's right. Exactly what you see. Everybody sees what you see. That's okay. You can ask questions. It's echoing. Well, we can do that for you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can, with IQ or I can do it, no problem. Columbia University is this independent K-8 on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, we have a one-to-one -one iPad program in grades K-2, to two, and we have a one-to-one -one laptop program in uh, grades 3-8. to eight. We have a bunch of other devices, so I actually like to say that we're many-to-one rather than one-to-one, -one, but uh, people then ask a follow-up question, what does that mean? So we'll just say one-to-one, -one. but um, we're very blessed because Columbia university kind of sees us as a department of the university so that um, we have a pretty generous budget and we're, we think of ourselves as a lab school so that we actively t test new things and try new things and i for one go to a ton of meetings and a ton of conferences and i have a huge uh, network um, of uh, teachers and technologists around the world who i can tap for resources and advice so 
uh, we're, I like to try new things and, and pass things on to the teachers at the school. Uh, so basically, I'm uh, the dedicated technology integrator for the middle division, so that's grades uh, 6, 7, and 8. We have another technology integrator, uh, Dylan Ryder, for grades 3, 4, and 5. And we have another technology integrator for K1 and 2, and her name is Gina Marcel, who's currently on maternity leave. So right now, uh, Anderson Harp is her maternity leave replacement. Um, and we talk a lot. We, we communicate, we share an office, we collaborate, we, we give each other ideas. Um, so it's been, it's a really lovely family um, in our, in our, within our school, uh, our tech integrated department. And it's a really interesting experiment of the school. The school is in its 11th year. And uh, we have this wildly diverse population of students. Uh, half of the kids come from the Columbia University faculty, so professors or employees of the university. And half of the kids come from the community. And I, I assist with technology. Um, and I never know who to unless someone tells me. Uh, and basically, there's no testing to get in. Nobody looks at finances or test scores. Um, so we have children who are just across the spectrum. And I'm actually slightly grateful that I'm not a full-time teacher at the school because we do have gifted, expert uh, you know, educators. But what they have to do is constantly differentiate. So they have to basically accommodate this, 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 this range of abilities and then differentiate for each kid. And they do it, and they do it willingly and happily and, and graciously. And um, and then I come in, and I and I hope to sort of level the playing field just by making sure that everybody's tech skills are up to par. And we actually do that by providing the iPads and the laptops. And then you know, as, uh, there's no I guess digital divide because everyone's coming in with the same device. I have ideas about that. Whether it makes sense to kind of have a modified bring your own device program. Uh, right now we're in a Mac. Um, but I am looking into maybe doing phone books and, and, and prototyping using that maybe with a sixth grade um, because for the most part, phone books are, uh, in terms of numbers, it's probably aren't accurate, 90% uh, effective. Um, and for everything we need to do as a Google Ads school, and they're like a third of the price. So we're trying to think about what we can do uh, just to shake things up. And a lot of schools are going to uh, phone book right now, so I'm looking into it. Um, Basically, my whole purpose is to work with teachers and faculty, excuse me, teachers and students to integrate uh, technology and have them use it academically, respectfully, and responsibly and productively. Um, so that is the school in a nutshell. Uh, I think I should say. I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Um, can I go to the next slide, Mary? Oh, I guess Mary. There you go. Okay, so I should advance until I figure out how to advance to the next slide. Ah, so, by the way, uh, these are things that I say all the time um, in the classroom and to parents and to my teacher friends and to anyone that will listen to me. Uh, I constantly say everything you do online is public and permanent and traceable. Just like the recording of this uh, fascinating presentation I'm giving right now, um, everything you do, every tweet, every text, every email, it, 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 it's out there. Once you put it out there, you can't take it back. And so that's something that we need to acknowledge and recognize and think about. Um, and also, it's, it's there. It's there forever. Even if you delete it, um, somebody else has a copy of it, or someone made a printout, or someone forwarded it. And it's traceable because the reality is, is that via IP addresses, or um, even having your email address or your phone number associated with something, or your account name, um, you're pretty much you're just there, uh, out there forever. Someone put in the chat window. So uh, we talk about that a lot. I also have all these conspiracy theories based on um, articles I read and movies I see about um, how you can kind of fudge things and get around, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to fully block where I am or, or go to like 17 different, you know, ISP to ISP to ISP in order to hide where I am. So I'd just rather scare the kids <laughs> or, and, and let them know that everything they do is eventually going to reflect upon them. Um, I also say that there's no such thing as privacy, and the word private has, just has a different meaning today. Um, so that it's no longer public versus private, it's now public versus less public. Um, if you want to use public versus more public, it's your choice, but the idea is that um, it's just out there once you put it out there. And the stuff is put out there willingly. Um, years ago, when, when uh, Fox bought, um, Google Smart Ops of Fox Corp bought MySpace, they bought it for hundreds of millions of dollars because it was full of information uh, a 
about brands and trends and what people were doing and seeing and eating and buying and who they were hanging out with and just all this stuff that was a marketer's dream. Um, and so it was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And now we have this Facebook. Ah, thank you, Mary. So now um, Facebook is also full of all this information. And as my former director of technology, Don Buckley, who was my mentor for the last seven years, um, we, we read a lot of Dana Boyd stuff, and we've seen Dana Boyd present a lot of the time. Uh, or we've seen her present many times, excuse me. And she, she will say that basically a, a social network is nothing. It's just empty until you populate it with information. Uh, it's, it's, it's social network is just full of who are you, who are your friends, and what do you do? And it's amazing how much of that stuff we put out there. We, we post totally willingly. Like, no one's twisting my arm to say that I saw the Lego movie last night. Like, I chose to show that. Um, so back to things I repeat endlessly. Uh, make wise choices. Um, so I got that. I used to work at um, a Sacred Heart school uh, a, a little while ago, from 2000 to 2006. And the Sacred Heart, there's a network of schools. I think there's 150 worldwide. And I worked at the one on 93rd Street on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And one of their goals and criteria was about making wise choices. Um, they had a slightly religious slant to it, whereas I just choose to think of those words, make wise choices. I actually heard a, a, parent, a father say that to his child dropping it, uh, when he was taking his kids to school the other day. And it made me really happy because it's such a great thing to say to, say to children. It's not uh, punitive. It's not, you know, don't mess up. It's make wise choices. Be, be actively, productively, and proactive about doing good. Um, I also talk about how we use technology academically, respectfully, and responsibly because all of these tools are out there. I just had parents uh, come up to me in the cafe on Friday and they said, hey, have you heard about this latest, um, this latest app called Kit or something? And I said, what to do? And the parents said, um, basically, it, uh, it lets you have group texting. And I said, oh, that sounds like Line or WhatsApp or, you know, whatever else is out there. Um, so, um, and they said, well, the kids are using it inappropriately. And I said, well, then we just have to have a conversation about it and remind them that everything they do is public and permanent and traceable. And they should make wise choices. Because every tool, Twitter, Flickr, um, Facebook, all of these, all of these, um, places to congregate can be um, used productively or non-productively. They can be used positively or negatively. So it's just a matter of teaching people and, and reinforcing and sometimes begging them um, to make wise choices. So let's see. Oh, and I also talk about being in a community. Um, so people are quick to blame each other, and I'm guilty of that as well sometimes. But the, the idea is that we're a community, so we have to do things that help reinforce community, build community, and um, just be kinder. Um, so that is something that I think about a lot. Um, somehow I'm going to use my arrow because Nellie said I can't. I found it. No, I didn't. Nellie. Um, I still don't understand where I'm supposed to go. Oh, I found it. Thank you, Nellie. You're the best. I appreciate it. So here's an example of what our classrooms look like. Um, basically, that's me with a group of uh, third. They, are, they might have been third graders at the time. Now they're fourth graders. And, um, and we have a newspaper. It's called the New York Times. Um, the kids named that because we thought it was a good sign on the New York Times. I'm actually going to put um, the URL in the chat window for the New York Times. So the idea is that um, here's a group of kids with their laptops. Um, and this is sometimes what it looks like when they're collaborating. We do have this one-to-one. -one. Um, sometimes they share. Sometimes they're not on their own. And they are, you know, like two people at a computer. Um, our classrooms look like this. Um, we're getting rid of those MacBook Airs. They're in their last cycle. Uh, excuse me, those MacBooks. Hi, to Karen. Uh, hi. Echoing. So I guess you don't have your headset yet. Sorry for um, um, so getting you before you were ready. No, no, no. You 100% asked everybody to have headphones ready, and I chose to delay that. Okay. How's that? Is that slightly better? Oh, we got a I yeah. Welcome to no, absolutely. <laughs> no, it's my secret. I don't know if you were here yesterday. walking all over Uh, they'll do that, and that's my bane. Um, hello. So, is are we just beginning then, Nelly? 
Yes, we are. And good to see you, Ken. I hope you're feeling well. Uh, thanks. I feel great. How about you? Okay. Can I ask one tiny question? So everyone sees video and everyone sees the slide simultaneously, right? Uh, okay, thanks. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, well then. Okay, I would have showered <laughs> had I thought about that. Um, hi. Uh, so, yes, I'm Karen Blumberg, and uh, I'm uh, currently an educational technologist at the school at Columbia University. Uh, it's in New York City, it's in Manhattan, and we're an independent school. Uh, so it just means that we're not a public school and people like to use it rather than uh, private. So I just want to figure out how to go to my next slide. I need a tiny little help with that, Nellie. In the meantime, that, oh, oh, that's, uh, if I wanted the arrow, I thought, right? Uh, unfortunately, the arrow is not doing anything. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, I appreciate it. So basically, uh, Columbia University is this independent K-8 to on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, we have a one-to-one -one iPad program in grades K-2, to and we have a one-to-one -one laptop program in uh, grades 3 to 8. We have a bunch of other devices, so I actually like to say that we're many-to-one rather than one-to-one, -one, but uh, people then ask a follow-up question, what does that mean? So we'll just say one-to-one, -one. but um, we're very blessed because Columbia University kind of sees us as a department of the university so that um, we have a pretty generous budget and we're, we think of ourselves as a lab school so that we actively tr test new things and try new things. And I, for one, go to a ton of meetings and a ton of conferences and I have a huge uh, network um, of uh, teachers and technologists around the world who I can tap for resources and advice. So uh, we're, I like to try new things and, and pass things on to the teachers at the school. Uh, so basically, I'm uh, the dedicated technology integrator for the middle division, so that's grades uh, 6, 7, and 8. We have another technology integrator, uh, Dylan Ryder, for grades 3, 4, and 5. And we have another technology integrator for K1 and 2, and her name is Gina Marcel, who's currently on maternity leave. So right now, uh, Anderson Harp is her maternity leave replacement. Um, and we talk a lot. We, we communicate, we share an office, we collaborate, we, we give each other ideas. Um, so it's been, it's a really lovely family um, in our, in our, within our school, uh, our tech integrator department. And it's a really interesting experiment of a school. The school is in its 11th year. And uh, we have this wildly diverse population of students. Uh, half of the kids come from the Columbia University faculty, so professors or employees of the university, and half of the kids come from the community. And I, I assist with technology, um, and I never know who's who unless someone tells me. Uh, and basically, there's no testing to get in. Nobody looks at finances or test scores. Um, so we have children who are just across the spectrum. And I'm actually slightly grateful that I'm not a full-time teacher at the school because we do have gifted, expert, uh, you know, educators. But what they have to do is constantly differentiate. So they have to basically accommodate this 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 these this range of abilities and then differentiate for each kid. And they do it, and they do it willingly and happily and and graciously. And um, and then I come in and I and I hope to sort of level the playing field just by making sure that everybody's tech skills are up to par. And we actually do that by providing the iPads and the laptops. And then, you know, uh, uh, there's no, I guess, digital divide because everyone's coming in with the same device. I have ideas about that, whether it makes sense to kind of have a modified bring your own device program. Uh, right now we're in a Mac school, um, but I am looking into maybe doing Chromebooks and, and, and prototyping using that maybe with the sixth grade. Um, because for the most part, Chromebooks are, uh, if you, in terms of numbers that probably aren't accurate, 90% uh, effective um, and for everything we need to do as a Google App School. And they're like a third of the price. So we're trying to think about what we can do uh, just to shake things up. And a lot of schools are going uh, Chromebook right now, so I'm looking into it. Um, and basically, my whole purpose is to work with teachers and faculty, uh, excuse me, teachers and students to integrate uh, technology and have them use it academically, respectfully, and responsibly, and productively. 
Um, so that is the school in a nutshell. Uh, I hope that's okay. I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Um, can I go to the next slide, Nelly? Oh, is that arrow working? Hey, you guys. <laughs> I'm just going to vamp until I figure out how to advance to the next slide. I don't know why it doesn't want to help. Ah, thanks. So by the way, uh, these are things that I say all the time um, in the classroom and to parents and to my teacher friends and to anyone that will listen to me. Uh, I constantly say everything you do online is public and permanent and traceable. Just like the recording of this uh, fascinating presentation I'm giving right now, um, everything you do, every tweet, every text, every email, it, it's, it's, it's out there. Once you put it out there, you can't take it back. And so that's something that we need to acknowledge and recognize and think about. Um, and also, it, it's there. It's there forever. Even if you delete it, um, somebody else has a copy of it or somebody made a printout or someone forwarded it. And it's traceable because the reality is is that via IP addresses or um, even having your email address or your phone number associated with something or your account name, um, you're pretty much, you're just there, uh, out there forever. Someone put in the chat window. So uh, we talk about that a lot. I also have all these conspiracy theories based on um, articles I read and movies I see about um, how you can kind of fudge things and get around. But I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to fully block where I am or, or go to like 17 different, you know, ISP to ISP to ISP in order to hide where I am. So I'd just rather scare the kids <laughs> or, and, and let them know that everything they do is eventually going to reflect upon them. Um, I also say that there's no such thing as privacy. And the word private it just has a different meaning today. Um, so that it's no longer public versus private. It's now public versus less public. Um, if you want to use public versus more public, it's your choice. But the idea is that um, it's just out there once we put it out there. And the stuff is put out there willingly. Um, years ago, when, when uh, Fox bought, um, Rupert Murdoch of Fox Corps bought MySpace, they bought it for hundreds of millions of dollars because it was full of information uh, about brands and friends and what people were doing and seeing and eating and buying and who they were hanging out with. And just all this stuff that was a marketer's dream. Um, and so it was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And now we have this Facebook. Ah, thank you, Nelly. So now um, Facebook is also full of all this information. And as my former director of technology, Don Buckley, who was my mentor for the last seven years, um, we, we read a lot of Dana Boyd stuff. And we've seen Dana Boyd present a lot of the time. Uh, or we've seen her present many times, excuse me. And she, she will say that basically a, a social network is nothing. It's just empty until you populate it with information. Uh, you, it, it, it's social network is just full of who are you, who are your friends, and what do you do? And it's amazing how much of that stuff we put out there. We, we post po totally willingly. Like no one's twisting my arm to say that I saw the Lego movie last night. Like I chose to share that. Um, so back to things I repeat endlessly. Uh, make wise choices. Um, so I got that. I used to work at um, a Sacred Heart school uh, a, a little while ago, from 2000 to 2006. And the Sacred Heart, there's a network of schools. I think there's 150 worldwide. And I worked at the one on 91st Street on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And one of their goals and criteria was about making wise choices. Um, they had a slightly religious slant to it, whereas I just choose to think of those words, make wise choices. I actually heard a, a, par a father say that to his child dropping it uh, when he was taking his kid to school the other day, and it made me really happy because it's such a great thing to, to say to children. It's not uh, punitive. It's not, you know, don't mess up. It's make wise choices. Be, be actively, productively, and proactive about doing good. Um, I also talk about how we use technology academically, respectfully, and responsibly because all of these tools are out there. I just had parents uh, come up to me in the cafe on Friday and they said, oh, have you heard about this latest, um, this latest app called Kick or something? And I said, what's it do? And the parents said, um, basically, it's, uh, it lets you have group texting. And I said, oh, that sounds like Line or WhatsApp or you know, whatever else is out there. Um, so, um, and they said, well, the kids are using it inappropriately. And I said, well, then we just have to have a conversation about it and remind them that everything they do is public and permanent and traceable. And they should make wise choices. Because every tool, Twitter, Flickr, um, Facebook, all of these, all of these um, places to congregate can be um, used productively or non-productively. They can use, be used positively or negatively. So it's just a matter of teaching people and, and reinforcing and sometimes begging them um, to make wise choices. 
So let's see. Oh, and I also talk about being in a community because um, people are quick to blame each other, and I'm guilty of that as well sometimes. But the, the idea is that we're a community, so we have to do things that help reinforce community, build community, and um, just be kinder. Um, so that is something that I think about a lot. Um, somehow I'm going to use my arrow because Nellie said I can. I found it. No, I didn't. Nellie. Um, I still don't understand where I'm supposed to click. Oh, I found it. Thank you, Nellie. You're the best. I appreciate it. So here's an example of what our classrooms look like. Um, basically, that's me with a group of uh, third. They're, they might have been third graders at the time. Now they're fourth graders. And, um, and we have a newspaper. It's called the New Roar Times. Um, the kids named that because we thought it was a good pun on the New York Times. I'm actually going to put um, the URL in the chat window, so the New Roar Times. So the idea is that um, here's a group of kids with their laptops, um, and this is sometimes what it looks like when they're collaborating. We do have this one-to-one. -one. Um, sometimes they share. Sometimes they're not on their own, and they are, you know, like two people at a computer. Um, our classrooms look like this. Um, we're getting rid of those MacBook Airs. They're in their last cycle. Uh, excuse me, those MacBooks, because now we have MacBook Airs in the middle school, and eventually we possibly might be prototyping Chromebooks. Um, so then, let's see, and I have this. So just an example of, you know, that they do collaborate, and sometimes one machine is totally significant and enough for doing the work that they're doing. So we have this uh, responsible use policy. And basically, uh, this is online. I have a website. It's the only piece of real estate I own, and it's not even real. It's virtual, but it's KarenBlumberg.com. And I wish I'd gone with .info, but I didn't think about it at the time. Uh, but at KarenBlumberg.com, I just try and keep track of um, some of the projects I do and some of the things I do um, in my professional life. It's nothing intimate or super personal since privacy doesn't exist online. And basically, it talks about um, what its responsible use policy. It's not the acceptable use policy or it's not the, you know, the end user license agreement, the EULA that some people have. It's the responsible use policy because even in the title, we... Um, we're expecting them to use technology responsibly, so we chose that word specifically. Um, and it's just about uh, using the technology facilities in the spirit um, of the school's code of conduct. So uh, we have a, sub, a subheading for respect, where it's just about using it con in con with consideration for others and respect for themselves, um, email for school-related purposes. And I talk about how I have multiple email accounts. And my school account, my school email is only for, for school purposes, and I tell the students that I know that and I use my school email for just school work nothing so they could if they wanted to they could try and hack into my account and they could be bored to tears because it's just work um, so we talk about that uh, we also talk about how you never ever ever want to put something in writing that might come back and affect you later and if you're angry or upset you'd never want to send an email the best thing to do is to talk about it either with an adult or the person that troubled you in the first place um, Let's see, we talk about safety and asking teachers for permission um, and keeping passwords private. And we talk about software and how a teacher can determine appropriateness and that they should not be going onto YouTube and just looking up any old videos, but rather if a teacher says go to YouTube and look at this video, then that's appropriate and that they should trust that the teacher is in the building, especially since it's a K to eight, um, <clears throat> presumably have the child's best interest in mind. So, and. And we'll be using these things academically. So we also have something about internet and not going online and visiting sites. Now, the truth is, is that Columbia University has no filters. So we are an open network. There's no password to get onto our network. You just sign on and you're in. And we do have, um, you know, the odd issue every year with kids visiting inappropriate sites or, or maybe sending, you know, not so nice emails to each other. Um, but the reality is, is that we see everything as a teachable moment, and we address it. We address it with the child. Sometimes we, we uh, talk about it as a class or as a grade or sometimes as a middle school. And it's important that they, they, they have that opportunity to, I guess, be in this walled garden so um, where they can make errors, you know, and, and they can learn from those mistakes. Um, and we can just, I guess, come up with better policies that will work for them. Uh, that might not make a lot of sense, but I'll show you the next slide, which just talks about the fact that we have this walled garden. We have Google Apps. 
We have the gallery, which is our photo repository. It's our answer to Flickr. It's like an in-house uh, Flickr. We have the tube, which is our in-house video repository. And so it's our in-house um, YouTube. Uh, the gallery and the tube are powered by Drupal. Um, and Drupal is just this cool open source thing that lets you build stuff, modules. And we have a server manager, a network administrator named Christina Martinez, who's um, amazing. She's, I'm just trying to read the chat. I mean, using original software is very difficult. Yeah, that's true. Um, so Christina Martinez helps build these modules for us. And she's been a godsend. And then we have the social network, which is powered by ELG, E-L-G-G. -G. And um, I'm going to put that in the chat, by the way, Drupal and ELG. And basically, that's our answer to Facebook. Or there are other modules, like uh, there are other things out there, like Schoology or Edmodo or other places that are willing to host either a content management system, a CMS, or a learning management system, uh, an LMS, or I think that's what those initials stand for. Um, we're fine with the social network. And every year, we actually archive the old social network and start an entirely new blank one just to reinforce that a social network is nothing until you populate it with information. Who, who are you? Who are your friends? And what do you do? So we use the social network. Um, uh, for collaborative projects, and I'm going to talk about one uh, later on. So the idea is that I'm hopeful that, I mean, it's a K to 8, mind you, it's not high school. So these children are too young for accounts on these other external sites that people use all over the world. They're not, they're not all 13, so they shouldn't have a Facebook, they shouldn't have a Twitter, they shouldn't have an Instagram account, and they're lying about their ages. And sometimes it's with their parental permi permission and sometimes it's not. But I talk to them about that. I say they're not old enough. So we've tried to come up with answers, uh, in-house solutions, and they're closed. You need a password to access this stuff, um, a username and a password. So the idea is that if they do make errors, they make it in this walled garden, and then it's less public. So that later, when they go to high school, um, they're, you know, they have a little more practice with using these social media tools and these social media sites and um, appropriately. So they do use it for fun. Um, they they can post. Uh, they can put up an album. They can put up videos. Uh, most of it is academic, but the idea is they just have. They get used to sharing, um, and often commenting. We talk about appropriate comments. They should be uh, when you're when someone puts up a post or a blog post, um, and and you're tasked with commenting. It should be specific. It could be uh, something that enhances and furthers the conversation, rather than uh, something like "great job" or "love it." So we, we want them to practice um, communicating online um, because that's, that's the reality of this world. Um, it's sort of monitored because the students kind of self-monitor and I check in and the teacher who's assigning projects check in. So basically, we have this new media server. Um, it's the, it's, we have Google Apps. We have a link to the wiki, the gallery, uh, things I just talked about. Um, the wiki we barely use anymore, but we used to use it a lot. Um, now we're mainly Google Apps and then these other Drupal tools for photos and videos and the social network, which is powered by ELG. So the kids get very used to seeing this um, new media server login window. It's like a, the, the, the initial window they see when they want to get to all of our other tools. So I mean, I talk with the students about what is media, what is literacy, um, what is new media? Uh, it's funny because media used to be like a floppy disk or something like that. And now we have this new media concept where people are taking things and reworking them and mixing them and editing them and being very public and sharing about them. So, um, you know, like you can make a song uh, and then you can share it with your friend who can work with it too or remix it and then you can publish it somewhere and then someone else can download it and remix it. But in the meantime, you can have a conversation about it. So it's amazing what just like how much more open and how much bigger these educational opportunities um, can be. Uh, we don't, we're very much into open source stuff at my school uh, for the most part. And so we, we don't have, um, for now, a, a formal LMS or CMS. So we're not Moodle. We do use Google Apps. And we've used Google Apps for everything. We have a million Google sites that we've created. Um, and I can't, a lot of schools are using more. Um, structured spaces, but not, not the school at Columbia. We haven't made that decision yet. So then I was thinking about a couple years ago, Don Buckley um, as the director of innovation. He's not, he, now he started a new nonprofit called Tools at Schools, where he's, um, he's count, counseling schools and consulting schools about design thinking and, um, and just like how to constantly innovate and be agile. 
uh, in their programs. Um, but we were talking about um, these these standards. So like ISTE is the International Society for Technology and Education, and they have this giant conference every year uh, in different cities. This year is in Atlanta at the end of Ju uh, at the end of June, and they have these uh, nets for students. So they're national educational technology standards and it's interesting because they have nets for students and they have nets for teachers and um, they have nets for so not educational technology standards for administrators so and they, they basically are like um, making wise choices actually um, like how to be a, a good citizen how to uh, cite your sources how to do research how to collaborate how to be efficient um, how to be respectful and responsible online um, so they're actually pretty interesting to look into. Um, and I just wanted to point out, I'm going to go back a step, that, that the, this, this teacher's picture is actually a photo I took at EdCamp NYC. I'm one of the organizers of EdCamp, which is Unconferences for Teachers. So the school has been hosting it for the last four years. And it's been pretty awesome to just open our doors to uh, people from all over the uh, New York City area to just come and learn from each other. And then this photo I used for the Nets for Administrator slide, it's actually an appy hour. So we totally stole that name from someone else that we used to call them. I forget what we used to call them, an app share. But appy hour is so much funnier. So um, the idea is that uh, the teachers are invited. We have these afternoon uh, professional development opportunities. And like once every few months, we gather the teachers together for an appy hour where they share apps that they've come across. Um, so it's pretty cool. And then they they lead the conversation. Whenever I offer a professional development opportunity, I mean, I'll I'll share, but the expectation is that everybody's sharing. Um, and I, I I prefer the idea, which is an EdCamp idea, of uh, facilitating a conversation rather than lecturing. Um, so let me think. What's the next slide? Uh, so then we have oh, my favorite person in the world, uh, one of Henry Jenkins. Uh, Henry Jenkins is brilliant. He was one of the speakers at the first TEDx NYED, and um, that's one of the, that's another conference that I've helped organize. Uh, I helped with the first three. I stopped helping with the fourth one, and I don't know if there'll be a fifth one. But Basil Kalani is the um, other person who's been really um, important, and he's helped. He's really brought all four of the TEDx NYEDs um, to fruition. So basically, it's an independently organized TED event, um, and TEDx NYED is for New York Education. Uh, Henry Jenkins spoke, and he's all about the participatory culture. And he, I believe, coined the term new media literacies. So um, they're, they're pretty amazing. And this is an, a, a, an awesome quote that I love by him. Uh, the new media literacies are a set of cultural competencies and social skills that young people need in the new media landscape. So this participatory culture shifts the focus of literacy from one of individual expression to community involvement. Um, and that, that kind of helps define what I think, how I think we should be using technology, um, uh, at least socially and academically. I, I, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I spend a lot of time talking to students about how to use technology appropriately and less about how to use it to like do computer science. Uh, that's super valid and important. Um, sometimes I'm a little embarrassed because I used to teach, teach robotics and programming when I was at Sacred Heart, but I've spent the last, this is my eighth year at the school, and I've done less like high tech stuff like that, although we're getting more involved in the maker movement um, these days. But I've spent a lot of time just, just teaching middle schoolers just kind of how to be appropriate and what it means to, to put something out there and to share and to collaborate. So it's super important, and I, I still think that what I do is of value, but I'm keenly aware that I'm spending less time uh, teaching like classic computer science-y things. So it's just something that I'm happy to talk about later. Um, I feel like I wish I, I wish I could uh, do both equally, but I'm having a difficulty with that. So uh, more power to the people that have figured out how to teach computer science and how to use technology appropriately. Um, anyway, so basically, th these are the new media literacies. So Henry Jenkins talks about play, and he talks about how play is the capacity to experiment uh, with the surroundings as a form of problem solving. So I, I mean, it's funny how one time, I remember years and years ago, I was teaching math at the Dalton School, and I was using Geometer Sketchpad to teach, uh, you know, uh, pre-algebra and pre-geometry. And I would talk about playing on the computer. And in my head, it was play because it was so fun to like figure out a math problem just by using Geometer Sketchpad. Um, and I got in trouble. <laughs> I got in, I got a little bit of flack for for using the term play because it was really work. 
but whatever. Um, I think of play as it's just, you know, solving problems. And I thought that was a good word, but you choose if you want to use the word play or not. I think it's important. Um, so then there's the idea of performance, where you're, um, it's the ability to adopt alternative identities for the purpose of improvisation and discovery. So I've got a, a, an example of a project that I think demonstrates performance. Um, there's simulation, which is the ability to interpret and construct dynamic models of real world processes. So these are all online if you were to search Henry Jenkins um, and his new media literacies. Um, there is appropriation. So this is from a project I do as well. Uh, it's the ability to meaningfully sample and remix media content. So I spend a lot of time talking with students about what, about what it means to be respectful when researching and citing your sources and what you can use and what you can't use and what's legal and what's illegal. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to adults about this too. And one of the things I always repeat, which I should have put on my slide, is um, the only thing worse, I think, than um, then students or young people doing inappropriate things online or grown-ups doing inappropriate things online. Um, I'm, I, and I give examples to my students about things I see uh, adults doing, um, either in the news, like politics, not the really dirty stuff. But um, politicians are doing crazy things. Sports people are doing crazy things. Uh, some of my friends are doing crazy things online and sharing really weird choices uh, in it, you know, like the, like either the language is inappropriate or the content is inappropriate or it's something so personal that it really should never have been put out there. So I try and give examples because I'm hopeful that they'll be better <laughs> at, at navigating these, these spaces than uh, the grown-ups are these days. Um, so appropriation is there. And then there's multitasking, which I don't think I can do that well, but it's the ability to scan the environment and shift focus to salient details. Um, there have been a lot of studies about whether or not people can truly multitask. Um, distributed cognition is um, this idea of you have this ability to interact meaningfully with tools to expand mental capacities. So just bleh, um, getting it out there. And then uh, this is one I think about a lot, this collective intelligence, which is like um, a little bit like Wikipedia is based on this. So it's the ability to pool knowledge and compare notes and with others towards this common goal. So I'm, I'm basically just quoting Henry Jenkins for each of these concepts. Um, these are his new media literacies. Um, a judgment, so the ability to evaluate the reliability and credibility of different information sources. So again, back to Wikipedia. And there are people I know um, that say that Wikipedia should never be used, um, especially not for students doing research. Whereas um, I, I use it, you know, I'm a, I, I use it, but I also know that it's not necessarily uh, accurate. So I also know to check my sources and look at another site too to compare the results. And my friend Kim Beeman, she's the librarian at Shrewsbury uh, International School in Bangkok. Um, I just reconnected with her last month. Um, and she, I used to work with her at Sacred Heart. So Kim is this, this head librarian and she has a whole staff and she's interacting with everyone in the school. And she, they said, oh, we don't use Wikipedia. And she said, but I do. And it's important that they know how to get information and then how to decide, you know, how to judge that information and decide if it's reliable or accurate. So she's, it's interesting because she's in this process right now of trying to explain to a school that it's okay to visit the site as long as it's not the only site that's being used. Um, so then there's transmedia navigation, uh, which is the ability to follow the stories and information across multiple modalities. So right now people are doing that with the Olympics. Certainly there's the Sochi hashtags on Twitter and uh, on television and then watching things on YouTube or sharing things on Facebook. Like, so you can see, you can learn about the Olympics by reading the paper online or offline and whatnot. Um, there's the next media literacy that Henry Jenkins talks about is networking. Um, so the ability to search for, synthesize, and disseminate information. And finally, his, uh, the, the, the next media literacy, the new media literacy, is this idea of negotiation. Um, and so it's the ability to travel across diverse communities, um, discerning and, and respecting multiple perspectives and grasping and following alter, alternative norms. So I took this picture in Thailand because you go like Swedi Ka, and so you, it's called why, you why to someone else. And it's just funny how even their Ronald McDonald statue um, <laughs> is doing the why, like the, the greeting of, of, of Thailand. So, um, oh, I forgot about visualization. So uh, just the idea of using data visualization, like the whole, like all this, this, this infographics movement and teaching students how to make infographics, but more importantly, how to decipher them and how to, how to uh, sh uh, use them. And it's funny how you can use data to represent anything. 
and you can even misrepresent data to represent anything. So these are the new media literacies. And I forgot the visualization was kind of added later after his first batch. So um, I've talked about what I think that we should be doing online. Um, you know, generally, like we should be doing things that are academic, respectful, responsible, and collaborative. And uh, I've talked about some of these new media literacies, which do, you know, I think about when I'm, when I'm working with teachers to develop projects and when, I, when I'm, you know, encouraging students to make some of the choices that I hope that they make. Um, and then I would just want to show a couple of examples of some projects. So the first one is this Renaissance Photoshop project. And this is actually something I've been doing for a really long time. Um, it basically it teaches Photoshop or Photoshop, or excuse me, or photo editing, because you're not married to the tool of Photoshop. Um, and in this particular version of the project, um, in sixth grade, they study the Renaissance at the School of Columbia University. And we, we strive to have these integrated projects. So um, they might be reading Romeo and Juliet in English, and they're singing and playing Renaissance music and learning about Renaissance instruments in music class. And they're sometimes, once a year, they actually did an anatomy unit a la uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and they studied anatomy in science and then made um, a, like a, an anatomy book, like drawings in art. And then we even did, uh, went to that bodies exhibit. I don't know if you know about that bodies exhibit, but you know, we'd have the, the plastics, plasticized organs and muscles and stuff. Um, so it was, it was, it was just an example. And they, actually, they even did like Renaissance games in, in, in wellness class and gym class. So it was this incredibly complex, integrated, thoughtful, thoughtfully produced experience that the sixth graders went through. And the, the, what I did was I worked with the um, art teacher specifically, and we came up with this Renaissance Photoshop project. Oh, even in Spanish class, they were looking at Renaissance painters and using like pintura. They were learning uh, Spanish words that, um, and, and looking at, there was something else, like Alhambra, the Alhambra. But it was just amazing how every teacher was just part of this, this greater experience. So I've been teaching Photoshop for a long time. And I've been using you know, this idea that you can rework an image. And you can, you can put yourself in a painting. And it's super easy to alter images, which is why we should be doubtful every time we see a magazine or a billboard. So, and I wanted the students to know that it's very easy to do this, that the professionals are doing it in such an amazing way that sometimes it's hard to believe your eyes, whereas they, as sixth graders, could do something um, you know, pretty powerful as well. So we have this Renaissance project, which this Photoshop, which evolved over the years. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of some of the slides that we've used in this project with the students. So we begin with this concept of photo manipulation. And we have a whole conversation about what it means to manipulate photos, that you're creating this illusion, this deception, analog or, or digital. Analogically, analogically or digitally. And my favorite, this is awesome because I work with the teachers to come up, we teach it together. And I, I showed her this and we talked about this because the history of doctoring photos is from the 19th century. And so that, that image on the left is a composite. So Abraham Lincoln, the, the portrait that we associate with Abraham Lincoln isn't even real. It's his head, it's his face on John Calhoun's body. So that it's crazy to me that um, even historically in the 19th century, they were putzing around with images and putzing around with them. So that's something that we share. And also and we show another thing, which is, and this is part of our, the lead into this project. So this is a National Geographic cover where it was edited because the pyramids were too far apart and they wanted a landscape portrait. So the, the art director moved the pyramids closer to each other so they fit on the cover of National Geographic. So we give them these examples and others. This is just, these are just samples of the slides. We actually have many, many more examples of photo manipulation. Um, but then, then we, that, that blends into the next conversation, which is this awesomeness, like that, it, that you can do this intentionally um, and hopefully honestly. So the History Channel had this wonderful um, ad campaign, and it was called, I think, Know Where You Stand. So know where you stand because history happens all around us. And so this one is the Hindenburg plummeting <laughs> in a disastrous way um, and on a field where this guy is currently walking a dog. Um, I think I included another image from the Know Where We Stand complaint, um, campaign. So here's like two people looking in the water, like picking up seashells uh, on the beaches of Normandy. So it layers this, this amazingly significant historical event with a more current image on the, in the same location. So that led to the next conversation, which was, um, 
uh, this Dove Evolution of Beauty campaign. Um, if you've never seen it, it's a few years old, and I'm I watch it probably five times a year with students, maybe more, because this girl getting made up, and she starts off kind of uh, regular looking, and by the end she's glamorous, and then they Photoshop her, and they they turn her into this this altered being, like extending her neck and making her eyes bigger, and um, and then they put it. On, then you see the image on a billboard, and these two little girls walk by. Uh, so there's lots of other things that are similar to this ad. I just think this is a pretty powerful ad. So we talk about that and what photo manipulation means in today's day and age. And then we finally get to the project, which is using Art Store. Uh, Columbia University has a subscription to Art Store. And we talk about what it to be to pay for the privilege of downloading or having the ability to download super high res photos, files of artwork. So they have images of paintings, they have images of sculptures, and they happen to have this huge collection of Renaissance art. So we talk about what it means to be have this accessibility, and we look at the terms of service. So this is a slide from the actual project. Uh, I skipped around, I, I've, I've removed some of the slides because otherwise I could go on about this project for a long time. I'm really happy with it and proud of it. Um, so they get their image from Art Store, and then they layer themselves in with, and they use Photoshop to do the editing. So here's an example of a couple years ago, this particularly remarkable child, and this is the result she made. Um, and while we're while we're doing this project, we talk about ownership and copyright and fair use. So here's another example of this child. Put, so they had an option of either making themselves the character, like the slide before, or they could add themselves to the image, as in this one. So this is not a super unique project. I've been doing something similar um, since like uh, 2000. So I might be, I've been doing this kind of a project for 14 years, but it just gets revamped every year. And we change the conversation that contextualizes the project every year. Um, and basically, then I give them examples on how to do it. Uh, and we say that because it turns out that in the terms of service, um, we are allowed to download these high-res files for academic purposes, for educational purposes, because we're subscribers. But it also turns out that these works of art, um, I give examples, and that's, I'm just forwarding through that. These works of art are not under copyright, uh, mainly because they were created when, uh, before copyright laws existed. So we talk about that in class, that the Mona Lisa is not under copyright. And we talk about the history of the Mona Lisa um, and how it was created and eventually gifted to the King of France. Um, I got this from Wikipedia, by the way. And that it was brought to France and then it stayed there and then it basically became part of this library of art. Um, but then the revolutions happened and then the art was for the people. So it was put in a museum, which was later the Louvre. It was later stolen from the Louvre by bandits and then eventually reclaimed, supposedly, whether or not it's the original is another you know, mystery. Um, but the idea is that it exists, this painting exists, and anyone can go and take a picture of it. And when you go and take a picture of the Mona Lisa without flash, um, then you own that photo, even if you don't own the painting. So it's kind of, it's just this really interesting way of thinking about it. Um, and then all these people put these photos online of the Mona Lisa, you don't own their photo, you own the one that you take yourself. So if you're going to use their photo, then you have to look at the licensing of this person's photo. You know, is it, are they sharing it? Are they, um, and, and are they licensing it to be remixed or to be redistributed? So there's so much back, there's so much into this. And the other thing is that, um, so here's the Mona Lisa. And then what about anyone that makes a, a, a piece of art using the Mona Lisa? So we talk about, is this art and who owns it? And we talk about Marcel Duchamp's um, postcard where he put a mustache on the Mona Lisa. And it turns out that this is, you can make a copyrightable contribution to a work of art that's not under copyright. So the Mona Lisa is not under copyright, but Marcel Duchamp's L-H-O-O-Q is. But it's only under copyright in France. It's not under copyright in America because each country has its own laws. So we have this whole discussion about that. And it gets a little complicated. Um, we also talk about, uh, I'm going to skip this, but it's another version of Andy Warhol. Like, he, he, this is a copyrightable piece of art, even though he used a photo of the Mona Lisa, only because the Mona Lisa is not under copyright. Um, we talked about, 
in this project, Shepard Ferry and his Obama Hope poster. And we talked about the whole history of this, where this photo was commissioned by the Associated Press at a, at a dinner, and the photographer has no claim over this photo because he was paid to take it, and he took it for the Associated Press, even though the photographer tried to claim that it was his. The Associated Press claimed the photo's theirs, and Shepard Ferry, the artist, was inspired by this photo to make this painting, which went viral. And so the Associated Press sued Shepard Ferry for not asking or getting permission for using the photo to inspire the artwork and also for not sharing any money from anything that any profits from this photo being sold and reproduced on posters and mouse pads and buttons and note cards and whatever. Um, he countersued with this idea that it was fair use and poetic license to to create this work of art. And then the judge dismissed the case because um, apparently Shepard Ferry destroyed evidence. Um, the Wikipedia article did not explain in detail what evidence he destroyed. Um, so, but the kids guessed, and they guessed amazing things. They said, well, maybe he sent an email to someone saying that he saw this picture and he was inspired by it. Or maybe he had like a, a big giant blow up and he did like paint by numbers or maybe he you know sent a text to someone and I was like yes that's the point is that this this evidence could be in any form it could have been there's so many, because of this new media and like that exists it could have been a voicemail or an email or a text or a printout so it's pretty cool that they were getting the sense that what they do is public and permanent and traceable anyway I'm so, sorry but that's that's just this awesome project so I think about that um, in terms of appropriation like they, they they appropriated this this renaissance painting and then they remixed it um, so I have an example, oh, and here's the reflection that we asked of them, like who owns this Renaissance composite they make? Because the reality is we use Columbia University's hardware and Columbia's University software in order to make their composite of uh, this Renaissance Photoshop composite. So we talked about that if they ever became a famous artist, um, Columbia might say that's ours, not yours. But in the meantime, they're sixth graders, so um, maybe Columbia would let them uh, have ownership of this project in the meantime. Uh, we also asked them to, we, they have this digital portfolio, it's a Google site they make, and they had to write about their, their experience with the project, and then they had to comment on each other's work. So that was actually the final piece. Um, in the meantime, we have another project called the Great Mathematician Project. So Sabrina Goldberg is a math teacher at the school, and she has the students uh, learning and researching learning about and researching one specific mathematician, and they have to write a research paper, and then they go online to our social network, which is empty at the beginning of the year, and they create, um, so here's the social network example, and what they do is they create a person, they create a faux profile, a fake profile for their mathematician, so that Euclid of Alexandria, for instance, exists. And they have to write about that yeah, person. Amazing, if you look amazing, at the bottom, amazing. it says "Get my profile pic." Uh, Karen, I asked them I to cite their photo, forever. and this might not be the most um, not academic in. way of listing uh, or citing please? an image, but it was good enough for me. Um, <laughs> Is that, are you sure? But basically, they have to all make this profile, and then they join the great no, mathematicians no, no, group, it's echoing, and then they that's quote, they they they, they write really blog well. posts, and then they like interact the um, as mathematicians. Uh, so if you look on the message board on the top right, Euclid of Alexandria wrote wrote the elements, you should read it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's hilarious. Okay, I'm and then Hypatia mic. of Alexandria um, wrote, hey, quiet. buddy, it's Hypatia. <laughs> like, this so is right funny. Now, so they're, point. they're, so um, your mic they're interacting, and, they're social and, um, networking as mathematicians. Yeah. Um, right. So then they're responsible for writing blog just, posts, yeah, and they're also responsible. Let me go back for a second. I'm sorry. You unplugged it? So if you and look, anytime in their skills section, every time they oh, write a word, it becomes a hyperlink, just like Facebook. So one of the skills of uh, Euclid okay, of okay. Alexandria right, so is please, geometry. Uh, free to add so then when you click the on chat, the word geometry, it links you to every other mathematician um, that used the word it? geometry somewhere yeah. in their profile. So it turns out that Buckminster Fuller exactly. and Pythagoras oh, of Samos uh, and other people box. use this word geometry. Yeah, um, I cut it off because it wouldn't fit in the image. So suddenly, feel free to add questions. And, they're um, again Carol furthering Lanter. this idea addition, that, that, that you can network and Tom's learn about other people because they have these link, common uh, tags, these words. Uh, Karen, so we talked about what it means us, to have a tag um, or a hashtag. You know, for, right, um, so this is on L, where our social on. network is. Uh, so this is, and then in the end, they they do this. They have to. They make a concept map showing how they're related to other mathematicians. So for instance, Euclid would have the word geometry linking him to Buckminster Fuller and Pythagoras, and he might have the word I don't know, but something else will. 
and link them to other mathematicians. So they have to them. plot why out why how two, the connections and, and happen, using, like first degree connections, um, second degree connections, Google and so sites. on. Uh, and, which and is I'm also another thing, like a social network is, how this, who are you, who do you know, know and what do you do? Students are managing, or the kids um, actually, then the project ends with uh, this actual so huge, amazing expo. And, and so kids dress up in character, and they talk to each other, and they present it. This is a seventh grade project, and they end up um, having this expo where all the social. kids of the school and all the teachers and parents are invited. And it's remarkable. They now really, I mean, as much as a seventh grader can, they really get a sense of this mathematician and what they what that mathematician's gifts were and what they what their lasting legacy was um, for the world. So it's pretty cool. Um, Sabrina Goldberg wrote about this project and it's actually um, on the cover story of this month's NCTM middle school edition, uh, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. So there's a there's a, a journal that they put out and uh, she was the cover story. So that was pretty exciting. So I had I think I had two more examples and I'm I don't know I'm just gonna talk <laughs> quicker. So we have this independent reading site. Basically, um, as, as many years ago, when I first got to the school, uh, Marisa Guastafero, who's now Marisa Mendez, uh, was the sixth grade English teacher, and I loved working with her. And she had these uh, book ring cards. So basically, uh, kids, as soon as kids finished a book, first of all, they'd keep track of what they were reading, like what pages and what dates uh, for each book. Each book was a note card. And then Every book they read was a new note card, which hung on this ring on the wall. And it was really visual and colorful and, and lovely. But we just thought maybe we could take it a tiny little step further. And if we put this in the virtual world, we can just have the kids connecting differently because it's hard to connect with a piece of paper on a wall. Also, the kids kept bumping into the, and the, and the note cards kept falling on the ground. So we actually ended up building um, the independent reading site using a Google site. And the idea was that every kid was responsible for keeping track of what they read. Um, and the expectations for posting are on this photo. They just had a list, the book title, the author, the genre, so the, the date started, the date learning. finished. They had to rate and it, um, like it over to bad or good. And, and then they gave a review. And, and, and the thing out. is, because it's a Google site, you could search it. You could search the site for uh, the book title or the author's name or the, the student's name, so if, uh, or I'm saying you know, if anyone not, wanted to see not, what I was reading, they'd search Miss the Blumberg. Uh, and you know, it was amazing the how this was just part of the assignment was, oh, you finish or a book, just put it up on the independent Columbia reading University site. The and then the kids were social networking about literacy. It was really awesome to watch for many years. And then Christina Martinez decided that, you know what? It's OK as a Google site, but she built us a Drupal version. So this is on Drupal. Um, and so they, it's basically it mapped. Uh, it didn't, it didn't transfer the information, but the kids like this better because it's more visually stimulating. Um, they, this exists in the in the real world. There's something called Shelfari. There's something called Goodreads. And the thing is, is that we just have this internal. Uh, we're fans of this There's idea of having these closed, by, uh, this walled Stein. garden, which I talked about before. Uh, help. Can we um, have so that access to students other projects can of just of explore. Is, is and if they're going to make any errors, at least they're doing it in a really safe, uh, enclosed environment right. rather than in a more public manner. So we have this independent reading site. Um, and uh, here's an example of how the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime just garnered responses whoever reads it feel, can comment on it and then you, they can comment on each other's comments so it's kind of cool that the students are using this um, multiple years um, and then let's say you read a book or let's say you read the purest incidents of the dog in the nighttime two years ago and now you're rereading it so you can make a new post and talk about your most recent um, response to the book so uh, and you have another project I was going to mention this uh, memory core project and basically, there's something called StoryCorps, which exists, and it's amazing and powerful. And basically, StoryCorps is trying to curate um, it on their website. They're celebrating t years of listening to America. And people, there are sites, there are physical sites. There's like um, these trailers or little structures. Um, and I've seen them in other cities, too. And you go in and you record your story. And when they post them on the site, they have a photo, a quote, a blurb, oh. and a link. So Marisa Guastafero slash Mendez and I started this memory Why don't core you project. Join us um, so and then Amy Cassell is the new uh, sixth grade. Um, join us uh, she's not the new, but she, she moved There's to sixth grade English. So she That's calls it this memory core the, project. And basically, we have these we uh, uh, 
Google presentation. No, no, so no, it's a slideshow. No, right Each now. student no in the class makes a slide. <laughs> no. And their no, slide kind of mimics based. StoryCorps. <laughs> so they have um, a, an image, a quote, a blurb, and some links. So it's pretty amazing. So we asked the students to go home and just interview someone. That's great. And some of them do it just audio. Some of them do it with video. Um, we asked them to transcribe the, um, the interview so that we can read it because sometimes it's hard to hear. And it's just that so you can have links. And learning That's about their great. histories, like it's All a great right, experience so I'd like for to the thank students, you, but it's Karen. also really cool for the teachers um, to be like, I know you didn't expect that. That happened in your family, and it's amazing. You know, um, so these are just some examples of slides. Room, so um, um, the, the quote they chose was, that night my family fled from that, that town, escaped, but, you know, and ended, it up, ended up on a passage to America. That it's, it's informal, right, this one. And she was a winemaker and a widow. And, and the, um, so you know, it turns out that this person found out that great-grandmother was a widow twice, and she was a winemaker. So. It's interesting how you can hear the story and <laughs> okay. this idea that we're all right. So thank oh, you and very I, by much. By the way, this project. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm looking forward. The they're reading Karen the was giver. in the book. So by in the way, English class, they're reading uh, the giver and Karen they're talking about the keeper of memories and what book. it means and to I'm have a memory Karen and pass it down or, or to hold on uh, to it or how do you share it and who gets to hear it. So again, an example of how we this faculty is amazing and they think about how to how to do things. It's just so thoughtful. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna stop in a second. That's sweet. This is the last example, I think. But um, and that was used me. Uh, that by the way, they, were Google Apps. So that was a Google I'm presentation. Insane. That's so it was true. a collaborative presentation. <laughs> Each kid accessed that Google Press and made a new slide for themselves. Another Google site. Um, this is current events. So in sixth and seventh and eighth, the social studies teachers have these current events sites. And what they what we do is it's just a it's a Google thank site. You, thank and you. There's a lot more that we can do. Students have to link to an article, uh, give a summary, have a supporting ways, image, other, other. have a Google map so it says where <laughs> right, in so the world you, is this article so happening, much. and then Everybody, have a good discussion and, um, question. And closing this so, class, we're going to go um, on these to are, uh, by the way screen snapshots, which is why they're not interactive. But here's an example of a story that a student posted about sea levels rising and um, this is near Battery Park. I think this was from Hurricane Sandy times.